Richard, um, there's a, a theme in COP26 is called Just Transition. Can you tell me more about it and your views on the importance of Just Transition? Yeah, so one of the themes of COP26 is Just Transition, and Susan was just speaking about fairness being at the heart of the uh, negotiations and outcome of the negotiations, and that's, that's very relevant to the Just Transition because um, I'm speaking as the First Minister in the Scottish Government for Just Transition, which is a new post be created, uh, and the Just Transition is a principle which has um, uh, largely been promoted by trade unions and labour organisations around the world because of the potential impact for workers, perhaps workers in a, um, in a, in a high-emitting industry who clearly, if we're changing things as we have to do, they want to know that they're going to have a job in the future and job security, um, so it's a big issue for labour organisations and trade unions. So the, the Just Transition is about making sure that we do move forward with fairness as we go towards our net zero targets in the decades ahead. And that, as Susan said, works in a global context, which is all around the debate of um, climate justice. And, you know, the Scottish Government, we've tried to play our role with climate justice. We've, you know, funded projects in Malawi, Rwanda, um, Zambia. And that's obviously quite a modest contribution compared to what the large countries of the world um, will hopefully be putting on the table at COP26 in Glasgow to help the, the global south and, and, and make sure that we treat the whole world with fairness as we go through um, where we have to go through in the coming decades to get to net zero. But my job in Scotland for Just Transition is to make sure we manage the way forward. We don't just have a, a cliff edge for any particular industry or community who suddenly just find themselves put out of work or facing economic dislocation, which of course is also relevant to Peace Day and uh, Peace One Day because, as you said at the beginning of this event, um, you can't have peace um, with um, you know, a climate emergency and a climate crisis. So we have to manage the climate crisis and deal with the climate emergency in a way in which we can keep and promote peace. Because if we don't do that, there will be economic dislocation and there will not be peace in the world. So my job in Scotland is just to manage the way forward for individual sectors of the economy, for communities, for people, and also is about addressing that point, I think, which again Susan made, which is making sure that there's not one generation or not one area or part of the economy or country who have to deal with a disproportionate burden of what needs to be done to decarbonise society and not you know, so there's no uh, no one pays a disproportionate cost. We have to share that equally and fairly across all societies uh, and across the world. So that's what just transitions about, and that's why you know it's great to see it's a big theme of the COP26. I think the two themes are people and just transition at COP26 in Glasgow. So Just Transition is a concept which is just again rocketed up the global agenda and, and you know, here in Scotland it's rocketed up the, the agenda here, here in this country um, as well. Yeah, it sounds like ethics, fairness, justice are at the core of any kind of solution that we're going to have in order to save the planet, right? Because if we don't do it the right way, it ruins it for everyone. And so this is not one of these situations where we can have winners and losers because that would be catastrophic. It will not help us save the planet. We need to make it fair and just for everyone. And I'm so, I'm so inspired that the conversations at COP26 will address this head on, that we will have these honest conversations and we, it will be with people like the two of you who have been so thoughtful about this, of thinking how do we make this transition so it is as easy and as graceful as possible because it will be challenging, but we don't have to make it harder than it already is, right? So um, I want to transition a little bit and I say, so Richard, what do you think are the signs of hope that COP26 will yield sufficient progress given the time that we have left in this decade? Well, the proof will be in the pudding when you know, we see the outcome of the, of the negotiations and ultimately this is world leaders, politicians um, getting in, into the room and, and negotiating. And I think what we're seeing from outside the, the political bubble is the rest of the world and lots of organisations and NGOs and public opinion putting pressure quite rightly on the politicians to deliver and actually not just have, make this a talking shop. They've got to deliver results and progress. So I do think that things are coming to head and I think that there is unprecedented pressure um, on the, the world leaders to produce action. Now, we'll have to wait and see if that actually happens. 
Uh, obviously, we hope it does because it's got to happen for the sake of the planet uh, and, and for the sake of all the things we've been talking about so far uh, in this event. So, you know, I don't know. I mentioned earlier on that President Biden has announced he's doubling the, the contribution for climate finance tonight. Uh, you know, hopefully in the run-up of the next uh, few weeks to COP26, we'll see more and more countries, you know, putting their their their, their money where their mouth is. Uh, and also the other commitments they have to make in their own countries to, to make sure we go in the right direction. So there's definitely hope. We must not think there's no hope. There's definitely hope. And, you know, the rest of the world, the public, you know, the general public have to communicate to their politicians and their governments that they want to see action. And this is it. We can't wait any longer. There's no more time to waste. Amen. Uh, Susan, so... Community assemblies are going to be a big part of COP26. Tell me a little bit more about them and how they're going to push to get action and progress out of the conference. Yeah, thank you so much, Margarita. Um, and so to zoom out a little bit, um, in selecting the 100 participants of the core assembly, we again ran sort of a, what we call a global location lottery which more or less means we started with a list of administrative districts around the world and using an algorithm weighed by population density, picked 100 of those in a lottery format. Um, and these are the 100 locations where the participants of the core assembly come from. But the key thing that we knew going into the process was that we wanted the global assembly to be able to exist beyond the walls of the core assembly. And so of course the core assembly is is precious in the sense that it provides us with that first sort of methodologically rigorous snapshot um, of the global population. Um, a sample weighed by all of these demographic criteria, such so as gender, age, attitude towards climate change, educational level, and geography. And so that 100 forms that mini world, that snapshot. But we also wanted people from all over the world, regardless of whether they were in a sortition selected, in a lottery selected location, to be able to follow along on the journey of the core assembly. And so actually we'll be publishing what we call our community assembly toolkits on October 5th and the official launch of the global assembly. And what this toolkit contains is the same information materials as the core assembly participants, as well as facilitation guidelines and event hosting tips for communities all around the world, you know, whether it's um, a middle schooler studying in Bukpo in, in South Korea um, or a public library located in Lakewood, Washington, really wherever you are and what, regardless of the profile that you're coming from, the community assemblies allows these local conversations to then feed into a global conversation. And so this is really at the undergirding basis of the, the thinking behind the community assemblies um, and ultimately the sort of outputs that we're able to gain from these localized community assemblies happening all over the world will feed into the final report of the global assembly that will be published in the next year. Um, and so it's about how we are trying to experiment with sort of different types of fora, really, of involving citizens. Um, when I say we're process geeks, um, what I mean is really speaking to the value um, that's at the heart of the project, which is that um, we're focusing on the means, right, as opposed to the ends. There are so many different solutions that brilliant people from everywhere are bringing to the table on how we can solve climate change. But actually what we at our team believe is that the most pressing solution at the moment is a better way of coming up with the solutions themselves. And so whether that's a methodologically rigorous citizens assembly in the form of the core assembly or sort of diffused community assemblies, um, both of these sorts of means are experimentations on our part um, that stem from, of course, urgency and necessity um, to change the way we make decisions um, to then feed into this global conversation. Um, and so I would just really encourage um, all of the community organizers, the young people, um, the folks out there who are trying to start the conversation in their local communities in a way that's tuned in um, to these global dialogues to really watch out um, for these toolkits that will be published on October 5th. Wonderful, thank you. So for our last segment, I have actually two questions. One is, 
What influence do we as individuals have in holding our governments to account for commitments made at COP26? And then the other is how as we as individuals, what can we do um, like starting today, starting tomorrow? Some action that's very, very specific that we can do to be more engaged in this conversation. You know, I think certainly in the United States we feel a little bit disengaged. Like, okay, government's over there and we're over here, and they don't, we don't, we're not really connected. But that's not true. I mean, citizens need to speak up and say this is what we want, and then politicians hopefully will say yes, this is the mandate from the people. How can we create a stronger mandate for our political leaders so they will do the right thing? Can I just firstly just um, just yes. for perhaps for Susan's benefit just say that uh, the Scottish government just announced uh, I think it was last week or week before that we are actually going to fund the 16th conference of youth, uh, which is the UN's official youth event for COP26. So I think the voice of young people is unbelievably important in this debate. This is all about the world in which our young people are going to grow up in and have their own children. So. Um, we're doing our best in Scotland at least to try and support the, the young people having a, a voice for COP26. So that's going to be a big event. Um, and I know Scotland will be sending five delegates to that conference, but um, obviously you know, there'll be a lot of people from around the world taking part. Um, in terms of governments being held to account, well, clearly as a politician I'm held to account by my own constituents who vote for me, and I can see from what they're saying to me that climate change and the future of the world is, you know, rising up their agenda. It's more important to them than ever before. They're, they're very concerned and worried about what they're hearing about the impact of the, the climate emergency. So, um, and what in Scotland we've done is we have set up a, a just transition commission who are going to oversee and monitor how successful we are as a government implementing um, the recommendations from the report that they gave us to, earlier this year about how to what we should do to have a just transition. So we've set up an independent kind of overseer who are going to hold me and my government to account about the just transition to make sure that we are doing our best to support people um, with getting new good green jobs, to make sure that they can afford to pay their, their fuel bills and their energy bills, that they don't rock it because of, um, because of the, the, the climate emergency and, and the, the policies that are adopted. So that's one thing we're doing, trying to hold us to account of what happens after COP26 is setting up, set, setting up that independent scrutiny body. But I think generally the public absolutely have to use every means possible to communicate with their elected representatives uh, and, and their governments. And you know, the more people that speak up and contact their, their, their representatives, then you know, the more pressure that will put on, on the politicians and the governments to act and deliver, because they've got to go back to their own countries after COP26. They've got to look their own people in the eye. They've got to look their own media in the eye. And they've got to explain what they signed up to at the negotiations. So, you know, they've got to be held to account. And I think um, I think hopefully that will happen. And the politicians know they've got to go back home to their own country after Glasgow. And they've got to be held to account by their own people. In terms of um, how people can get involved at a local level, I think that is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, this has got to be a bottom-up movement, not just a top-down from governments and organisations and big companies. It's got to be about people, households, communities, um, taking action to, to work together in their local communities, local areas, towards net zero, to adopt different actions. It might be sharing electric cars, you know, car share schemes, or it might be, you know, working on clean energy schemes. I, I today, was visiting a, a clean energy scheme that's been built next to a college, uh, which the, will help power the college but the college will also use it for educational purposes and the local community are involved in that as well. So I think there's lots of ways at ground level, at the grassroots level, we have to have this as a bottom-up um, transformation of society towards net zero. And uh, there's various ways governments can help empower people to, to have a voice locally and also get some resource locally as well they can use to actually do things locally in their own communities to move towards net zero. Great, thank you. Susan? Yes, thank you so much, Margarita. I love this question. I'm so happy you coupled these two facets. Um, and I'll comment really quickly on the last bit because I know we're running a little late on time. Um, you know, I think traditionally when we ask about what individuals can do, it's often only framed in the first part of that question, which is how can citizens put pressure on governments, influence them, the real power holders to do their jobs. And the second part about scrambling 
um, to begin with, scrambling the divisions between the citizens and power holders is really at the heart um, of, I hope, the message that I can bring across today, um, which is that citizens' assemblies already, right, are coming up with policies that are as ambitious, if not more, and compelling than politicians. Um, sort of, in my view, I'm a very simple person, um, and it seems that we as everyday citizens are the most untapped repository of knowledge and wisdom. Um, and again, speaking as a very simple person, um, it's about more knowledge or less, you know, more companions and the plotting of a shared future that all of us are going to share regardless or less. Um, and so we were talking about, you know, these moral sort of tides and global governance before. Um, and though in my parents' time, it may have seemed like we were at the end of history, um, clearly we can see now that our systems are becoming increasingly outdated. Um, and so it's not only about increasing pressure on politicians, but again, rethinking these new partnerships between power holders and everyday people. Um, and I'll just quickly end on this proverb that as we get ready for the core assembly to start in October 7th, as we get down to crunch time, has been living in my brain rent free, which is that you can't cover the sky with the palm of your hand. Um, it's inevitable, right? And there's a foolishness in attempting to do this. Um, and to me, it speaks to the reality of climate change, that the dogged faith now that things are all going to be okay with that action is very much the same as trying to cover the sky with your palm, the same level of foolishness and inevitability. But also, it's about the power of citizens and participation, about the people around the world who are now increasingly demanding that we scramble those um, divisions and change those partnerships. And in COP26, we'll have a chance to hear from the snapshot of individuals. Um, and at this point, it'll be as obvious as, you know, trying to cover the sky with the palm of your hand that the future of decision making around climate is inevitably participatory. Thank you for those beautiful words, Susan. And with that, I will be wrapping up this panel. As we know, no climate action, no peace. You know, with peace, uh, extreme weather uh, patterns, increasing water insecurity, food insecurity, we will have conflict. So we need to protect the planet's resources in order to maintain the peace, and we need to be able to peacefully collaborate in order to save the planet. The two are interlinked. I thank you so much for taking the time to spend uh, with us on Peace One Day, 21 September. Thank you so much, and for all of you who are listening, Go and find, talk to your politicians, write to them, communicate to them on social media, and let them know that climate change is something that they need to work on and give them that sense of urgency. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, we'll move on to the next panel. <music>